Hello, and thank you very much for the invitation. So, uh, in this talk, I'm going to, to talk about the relationships between some cohomological properties of fields and some more Diophantine properties of fields. So, I'm going to take some time to explain the, the motivations. And uh, to do so, I would like to, to first introduce a notion due to Ottin and Lang that corresponds to the intuitive idea that over some fields, if you take some equations in a large number of variables and of small degree, then they will have automatically solutions. So more precisely, uh, if we consider k a field, then we say that k is ci if it satisfies the following property. So for any projective hypersurface X. So in P and K, a projective hypersurface of degree, let's say D, such that D to the I is small or equal than N. So this is uh, the, the condition that says that we are looking at equations with a large number of variables and of small degree. Well then, this hypersurface has automatically a rational point. OK, so what are the basic properties of these uh, uh, CI properties? Well, for example, the first example, which is not very interesting, is that uh, a field is C0 if and only if it is algebraically closed. This is essentially by definition. A more interesting example is the case of uh, finite fields. So this is a theorem you have probably encountered. And that is called uh, uh, Chevalier warning theorem. So the Chevalier warning theorem states uh, that a finite field is always C1. Then there are also some transition theorems. So, for example, we have the uh, theorem due to Tsen, Tsen's theorem, which allows us to understand what happens when one takes some extension of finite uh, transcendence degree. So more precisely, let's consider k prime over k of uh, transcendence degree, let's say delta. And if k is ci, then k prime will be automatically ci plus delta. And finally, I'm going to state uh, one final example, uh, which is uh, much more subtle than the three previous ones. Uh, it's a consequence of Greenberg's approximation theorem. And it allows one to understand what happens uh, with formal power series. So more precisely, if k is ci, then formal power series in one variable are ci plus 1. And the proof of this result is based on Tsen's theorem. One essentially reduces to the case of Tsen's theorem. So these are positive examples. There are also, of course, fields that are not CI. So uh, as counterexamples, one has a lot of counterexamples. Some of them are not interesting at all. For example, the real numbers are, of course, not CI for any i. But a more interesting case is the case of periodic fields. So our team conjecture that conjectured that uh, periodic fields would be C2, but he got it wrong. And we have uh, the following theorem. So due to Terjanian, Arkhipov uh, Karatsuva, and Alem, which states that, in fact, uh, Piatic fields are not CI for any I. Okay, so this was the more Diophantine side, 
Now, uh, as I said at the beginning, we also want to, to talk about cohomology of fields. And so, as you know, when you have a field, you have its Galois cohomology. And uh, then to this Galois cohomology, you can associate an invariant, which is the cohomological dimension. So the cohomological dimension of, uh, let's say, a perfect field K is just defined as the number that I will call CD of K, and it's uh, the minimum of uh, uh, the uh, n, such that for all order equal to n plus 1, and for any Galois module, finite Galois module m, the cohomology of m at rank r vanishes. So it's essentially the last rank of cohomology that is interesting. OK, so we want to relate this to cohomological properties. And in fact, uh, sorry, Jeffenstein properties. And in fact, if you look at the properties of this uh, cohomological dimension, they are in fact in parallel with the properties of the CI fields. So for example, the cohomological dimension of an algebraically closed field is 0. The cohomological dimension of a finite field is 1. The, in the case of uh, Tsen's theorem, where we have an extension of transcendence degree delta, then the cohomological dimension of k prime is at most the cohomological dimension of k plus delta. And finally, in the setting of Greenberg's theorem, the cohomological dimension of k double parenthesis t uh, is equal to the cohomological dimension of k plus 1. So you see that there's a par parallel here. And then one may ask whether uh, uh, there is some relationship between the cohomological dimension and the CI property. So in the most uh, naive case, one may say, OK, maybe a, cohomological uh, a field has cohomological dimension at most i, if and only if it is ci. This question is, in fact, over-optimistic, because we already have a counterexample, which is here. If you take a piadic field qp, then you know that uh, it is not c2, and not even ci for any i, but it indeed has cohomological dimension 2. And so you cannot say that there is an equivalence between the CI property and the cohomological dimension. Of course, this uh, counterexample only contradicts one direction of this because, uh, I mean, we don't know whether if we have the CI property, then we can deduce that the cohomological dimension at most i. This is a question that was raised by Serre, and it's still open nowadays. OK, um, so what do we want to do today? Well, the idea is uh, to try to modify, so how to modify the CI property so that it characterizes the cohomological dimension. And so uh, here I want to talk about some conjectures which are due to Katman Kuzumaki. So now I have to choose the good button. Which are due to Katman Kuzumaki. Maybe let's wait. And which uh, essentially seek to answer this question. So they propose some uh, variant of the CI properties and they expect them to characterize cohomological dimension. So that will be the second part of the talk. We will talk about uh, Milner K theory. And Kato and Kuzumaki's conjectures. <laughs>
All right, so the starting point is to introduce Milner K theory. And so I'm going to define it. So the definition is very, very explicit. Let's consider K a field. And then the Milner K theory of K is defined as follows. So it's a sequence of groups. We have first the zeroth Milner K theory group of k, which is by definition just z. And then for higher degrees, so let's say for q larger or equal than 1, the qth Milner k theory group is defined as a quotient. So above on the quotient, I have a tensor product of a certain number of copies of k star. And here I have q copies of k star. And inside this tensor product, I mod out all the tensors, pure tensors, x1, tensor, tensor, xq, such that two different coordinates add up to 1. So there exists i different from j, such that xi plus xj is 1. OK, so this is very explicit. That does not mean it's easy to compute. Uh, typically because this definition mixes the multiplicative and the additive structure of the field. Um, this definition also might seem a little bit, uh, uh, I mean, when, it, when presented like this, we don't really know where it comes from, but it's a very natural definition, so it, it appears in many different contexts. For example, uh, Milner K theory, <coughs> is crucial to study quadratic forms over k. So why is that? Uh, well, typically when one wants to study quadratic forms over k, one considers uh, the Witt ring of k, that is the ring that classifies quadratic forms up to hyperbolic planes. And then inside this Witt ring, there's a fundamental ideal that is spanned by quadratic forms of even degree. And uh, then to study quadratic forms, you consider the Witt ring endowed with the filtration given by the successive powers of the fundamental ideal. And so you want to understand what's the quotient between two consecutive powers of the fundamental ideal. And there's a very deep theorem, uh, which is called the bloch cato conjecture, that tells you that this different quotients can be uh, uh, understood as quotients of the Milner K theory of K. Another context well, where all these uh, Milner K theory appears uh, is, for example, in class field theory. Well, of course, it's related to quadratic forms. But in class field theory, when you want to study, for example, Hilbert symbols, That's just because Hilbert symbols satisfy the relations that are here. If you take a Hilbert symbol with two entries that add up to one, then it is trivial. OK, so apart from Milner K theory, I will also need to state these conjectures another structure, and that's a norm morphism on Milner K theory. So let's talk about the norm. OK, so what do we want? We want to study what happens when we look at some finite extension L over k. And what we would like is to have a morphism going from Milner K theory of L to Milner K theory of k. And we know how to do that in low degree. So for example, if we look at degree 1, well, uh, what is Milner K theory in degree 1? The K1 of L is by definition just the multiplicative group L star. And similarly, the k1 of k is the multiplicative group of k. And between these two groups, we have a usual norm. So it's just the usual norm we always work with. In degree 0, we can also build up uh, such a morphism. It's also very easy. So here, the Milner k theory in degree 0 is always z. And therefore, the norm will be multiplication by some integer. Which, inter which integer will we choose? Well, we will multiply by the degree of the extension. 
So this is the norm in degree 0 and 1. And then one wants to uh, extend this to any degrees. And so this is a quite deep theorem due to Cato. So uh, which states that uh, uh, there exist uh, norm morphisms Let's say an L over K going from Qth Milner K theory of L to Qth Milner K theory of K, satisfying some, comp some compatibility properties. So the first thing is that uh, we want these norm morphisms to be defined as before in degrees 0 and 1. We also want to have a compatibility between different degrees. So this is a projection formula which tell you, tells you that if Q can be written as R plus S and you take S in the R of Milner K theory group of the big field L and Y in the S Milner K theory group of the small field K then you can compute the norm of x tensor y just by computing the norm of x and then tensoring with y. OK, and finally, uh, this norm morphism should have the usual property of compatibility with respect to towers of extensions. So we want that if m over l over k is a tower of finite extensions, then the norm from m to k should be computed by computing first the norm from m to l and then from l to k. OK, so that's everything we will need about uh, uh, Milner k theory. And now I can introduce the objects that appear in this uh, uh, conjecture of Kato and Kuzumaki. So the main definition is the following. That's in the year 86. Yes? Uh, with these conditions, yes. It is. Um, Yes, so the first part of the definition, I'm going to consider z over k variety and q a non-negative integer. So this q will determine the degree of the k theory we want to look at. And uh, we introduce a subgroup n q of z over k. So this is a subgroup of the qth Milner k theory group of k. And it's defined as being spanned by the images of the norms, norm L over K of Qth Milner K theory group of L. So we look at the images of the norms, but we don't look at all finite extensions of L. We only look at those over which our variety acquires a rational point. OK. I'm going to give examples about this, but uh, uh, before that, I want to, to, to finish the definition. So the second part of the definition, here we are going to consider two parameters, i and q. So i will play the same role as the i in the ci property, and q will, play, uh, will, will tell us which degree of Milner k theory we are looking at. And uh, now I can define the property that will replace the CI property. So we say that K is CIQ if we have the following uh, property. So for any finite extension L of K, for any projective hypersurface Z over L, so this is a hypersurface, of degree d with the usual inequality, so we want d to the i smaller or equal than n, then 
instead of asking that z has a rational point, we ask that the group nq of z over l is uh, the biggest possible. So it is the whole Milner k theory group of l. OK. Uh. So maybe let's look at some basic examples. So let's look at the extremal cases. Uh, so first, I want to look at the case where q is 0. What happens if q is 0? Well, if q is 0, uh, the Milner k theory groups that appear up there are just z, right? And the norm is the multiplication by the degree. So this means uh, that the n0 of z over k OK, this is a subgroup of z. And it's, in fact, the subgroup spanned by the index of the variety z. So this is, recall, the GCD of all the degrees of finite extensions where z has a rational point. So this is n0 of z over k. And then uh, if we look at the second definition, this means that k is ci0 if and only if, well, for any L over K, for any uh, hypersurface Z with the conditions up there, then uh, Z has index 1. Or if you prefer, it has a uh, zero cycle of degree 1. So this means that this property is, of course, weaker than the CI property. Let's look at the other extreme case. So this is uh, essentially when i will be 0. So when i is 0, this means that in the second definition there, we can just choose a, for z a point in p1. And so we just need to understand what is nq of spec l over k. And of course, by definition, this is the image of uh, norm L over K over Q of Milner K theory. And hence, uh, K is uh, C Q0 if and only if for any tower of finite extensions M over L over K, the norm uh, from M to L is surjective. And so here, what you, what you have to see is that so we have these two extremal properties. The first one is much more uh, in the taste of rational points and a Diophantin property, whereas the second is much more k-theoretic. And all the other CIQs will be some intermediary properties between these two. I'll give a Final third example. Uh, so uh, let's say that uh, I take Z a Severi Brouwer variety. Then we know that uh, this Severi Brouwer variety corresponds to some central simple algebra A. And then uh, we can express in a very simple way the n1 of z over k. The n1 of z over k is, in fact, uh, the image of the reduced norm on A. So this is a very uh, explicit way of describing the n1 for a severe Brouwer variety. OK, so now uh, we can try to see what uh, Kato and Kuzumaki uh, thought about. So Kato and Kuzumaki observed uh, 
that bears the following proposition. In fact, they saw that uh, this second property here, the one that is the most k-theoretic, indeed characterizes cohomological dimension. So more precisely, they proved that k is CQ0 if and only if the cohomological dimension of k is at most q. So the proof of this uh, proposition is based on a very big theorem, which is a uh, bloch cato's conjecture. So this is based in bloch cato's conjecture, which has been proved by Rost and Vyvodsky. So uh, by using bloch cato's conjecture, the proof of this proposition is pretty easy. Uh, without it, I don't know how to do it. OK, so they proved this. And then they made a conjecture that essentially stated that it's not only the case of this C0Q property. In fact, all the CIQ properties should, should uh, characterize cohomological dimension. So, so the history could show. Yes. No, it was not proven. So they proved it assuming block cato. And nowadays it's proven. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're right. Um, so uh, they conjectured the following. A field K is CIQ if and only if the cohomological dimension of k is at most i plus q. Or if you prefer, in other words, the CIQ, CIQ property should only depend on the sum of i and q. Diego, is even the case of q equals 0 hard? I mean, isn't the obvious that's saying that? Sorry? Just wanted to say what that says, like that proposition. In this proposition? Right. Yeah. I mean, the case q equals 0 will be, will be easy. It's, uh, it's essentially just saying that you, 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 you just apply your, your property to your finite extension. So you, you can, in, in the case, OK. Uh, you, yeah, you can, you, I mean, you have i equals 0, so so you can just take a point in the projective line. You can apply it to the spectrum of a finite extension. And then essentially it's saying, telling you that, uh, I mean, you're algebraically closed. Any finite extension is trivial. Okay. Uh, okay, perfect. Yeah, uh, oh, okay. So. I didn't want to enter in this, uh, in this uh, discussion. I will talk a little bit about it later. But uh, uh, um, I mean, the definition I've given for cohomological dimension is only for perfect fields. If you want this to hold for imperfect fields, you need to modify the definition of cohomological dimension. And if you do, they, they, I mean, they conjectured that it would be true even for imperfect fields. OK, so the problem with this conjecture is that it is wrong. <laughs> so this was seen some years later, uh, first by Mercurieff. So this was in 1990, where he gave a counterexample in homological dimension 2. And uh, just a bit later, Colliotelen and Madol. even gave counterexamples in cohomological dimension 1. So the, the conjectures are completely wrong. However, all these uh, uh, counterexamples are very big fields construct constructed by a method essentially due to Mercury F uh, by transfinite induction. And so uh, there are 
two main questions that remain open here. So the first question, which was raised by Wittenberg uh, some years ago, is whether one can uh, uh, prove Kato and Kuzumaki's conjectures uh, for fields appearing usually in arithmetic geometry. And he started answer, answering this question. So in 2015, he proved that, uh, OK, if you look at uh, piadic fields and uh, total imaginary number fields, Well, these are cohomological dimension two fields, so you expect them to satisfy three properties, the C20, the C11, and the C02. Um, so by this proposition of Katan Kuzumaki, we know that the C20 property here is okay. Uh, Wittenberg proved the C11 property. And uh, the C20, the C02 property is still open. But so he proved, uh, in particular, the C11 property for these fields. Um, a little bit later, I also looked at some other fields. So I proved the conjectures, uh, uh, typically for uh, function fields of complex surfaces, uh, complex uh, varieties, sorry. or the same kind of fields, for example, where you add some form of variable. And I guess those are the usual fields for which we know uh, some things concerning these uh, conjectures on Kat of Katja and Kuzumaki. As I said before, this is not the goal of the talk today. The goal is the second question. Uh, so can one modify the CIQ properties so that they characterize cohomological dimension. And so this is the question we are going to try to look at uh, now. To do so, I'm going to introduce uh, the third object that appeared in the title of the talk, that is homogeneous spaces. Okay. So uh, we want to modify the CIQ property, and uh, the idea to do so is to uh, replace projective hypersurfaces of low degree by other kinds of variety, typically homogeneous spaces. And so the definition we consider is the following. So uh, consider a parameter Q uh, larger or equal than zero. And we say that a field K is, so let's say, a CQHS, uh, 
respectively CQPHS and respectively CQ red. If the following property holds, so we want that whenever we pass to some finite extension L of k, and whenever we consider x, uh, which this time is not a projective hypersurface, but uh, for the CQHS property will be a uh, homogeneous, so overall a homogeneous space and uh, a linear connected algebraic group respectively for the CQPHS we will ask that X is a principal homogeneous space and there again a linear connected algebraic group and finally respectively for the CQ red property uh, X over L will be a principal homogeneous space under a reductive group Okay, so these are the varieties we consider, and then we require the same conclusion as in Katos and Kuzumaki's conjectures. So we want that uh, the NQ of uh, X over L is the whole Milner K theory group. Sorry? Yeah, by reductive, I mean. Connected reductive. Yes. So, so, sorry? Overall. Overall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, okay, and now the theorem is exactly what you imagine. So uh, the theorem which is uh, with Lucchini Artece this year. Um, the theorem states exactly what you expect. So uh, essentially here, the, these varieties are so that we want to replace essentially uh, projective hypersurfaces of degree D with D lower or equal than N. So in fact, we want to replace the C1Q property and so what we expect here is uh, the following result. If k is perfect, then uh, k is CQHS if and only if k is CQPHS if and only if uh, the cohomological dimension of k is at most q plus 1. And secondly, uh, if k is imperfect, well, or in general, I mean, it's a weaker property. Uh, if k is imperfect, k is CQ red if and only if the cohomological dimension of k is at most q plus 1. And here, when I say cohomological dimension of k smaller or equal than q plus 1 in the imperfect case, it's uh, what I said before to the question of Young. Uh, uh, we have to modify the definition of the cohomological dimension so that it works out in, in the imperfect case. So, uh, sorry, I can't hear you. Can, can you repeat? I mean, in, in, if you want, I can say for any field here. Okay, so uh, 
some remarks uh, about this. So the first remark uh, is that uh, uh, so this theorem says that the uh, CQ HS, uh, CQ PHS, and CQ red properties are good replacements. for the C1Q property. So then uh, one may ask what happens if one replaces this one by some other things, let's say two, three, and so on. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about this uh, today, but uh, uh, with Giancarlo we are working at least for the moment on the case uh, where we have a two here and we think we have a good replacement for that. Um, the second uh, remark is that, uh, uh, okay, so what did I want to say as the second remark? Um, yeah, so for, you have here quite a lot of implications. The, in my opinion, the interesting uh, direction in these theorems is from right to left. So going from cohomological dimension to the more arithmetic properties, because usually it's easier to compute a cohomological dimension rather than proving some Geoffentine properties. But uh, if you want to go the other way around, in fact, you don't need to look at all principal homogeneous spaces. So uh, let's say in the first part of the theorem, uh, so uh, for the implication Uh, K is uh, uh, CQHS implies cohomological dimension of K is at most Q plus one. One only needs to check so principal homogeneous spaces and the nomic tori. Or you have the choice, uh, several broad varieties. Okay, so now I want to see what this theorem tells us for low values of Q. So what happens if I take Q uh, equals zero? Yes. So, 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 sorry? So from homogeneous to <laughs> principal homogeneous spaces. Is this by, by taking associated, associated cross or something? For, for, for the implication, I'm going to explain a little oh. bit the proof afterwards, but yeah, I mean, uh, fr from here to here, that's the question, that, that's essentially a non-abelian cohomology. Again? Non-abelian cohomology, oh. playing with that. Um, okay, Q equals zero. Uh, so let's say I'm in the perfect case. And then in the case Q equals zero, it is telling me that the cohomological dimension of K is at most one, if and only if, uh, for any L over K finite, every homogeneous space under a uh, uh, linear connected group has a zero cycle of degree one. And this is a consequence of, in fact, a classical theorem, which is due to Steinberg and Springer. And which states that in this context, there's even a rational point, and not only a zero cycle of degree one. Um, what happens if Q equals 1? Well, if Q equals 1, 
let's say that uh, we don't look at all principal at, at all homogeneous spaces, sorry, but we look just at some at some of them, the Savary Borough varieties. So uh, consider um, uh, uh, restrict to Savary Borough varieties. And recall uh, what I said before, in the case of Savary Brouwer varieties, the N1 can be described as the, uh, as the image of the reduced norm of the associated central simple algebra. So in fact, uh, the theorem in this particular case is telling us that if K has cohomological dimension at most two, then for any central simple algebra A over K, uh, the reduced norm of A is surjective. And this follows from also a classical theorem due to Suslin. Finally, I'm going to show you the last uh, case of this theorem that was previously known, which is in a much more arithmetical setting, which is due to Wittenberg. So finally, uh, we know, we previously knew this theorem in the case of p-adic fields and total imaginary number fields. So the case of p-adic fields and total imaginary number fields had been established before by Wittenberg in 2015. So in the same paper I cited before. And of course, here the proof is uh, uh, very arithmetic. I mean, using essentially a lot of class field theory. OK, so that's all for the remarks. And now I'm going to uh, say a few words about the, the proof, the sketch. OK, so we have some, uh, I, I'm just going to, to, to talk about one. So we have uh, uh, some implications to check. There's one which is obvious, of course, the, the first implication from left to right. Now, uh, there's another one which is uh, pretty easy. Let's say that K is CQ PHS. And we want to prove that the cohomological dimension of K is at most Q plus 1. So in this case, the idea is to use uh, the proposition I told you before due to Katwan Kuzumaki and that gives a characterization of cohomological dimension in terms of surjectivity of norms on Milner K theory. So if you use this proposition, this means that uh, we only need to show that uh, whenever we take a tower of field extensions m over l over k, the norm from m to l on Qth uh, Milner K theory is surjective. That's what we have to prove. And so, uh, well, we are going to prove it directly. So we are going to take some class of a tensor, A1 tensor tensor AQ. Uh, sorry, it's at the level, I mean, cohomological dimension Q plus 1. So you need plus, plus 1s. And so I take a tensor, A1 tensor tensor a q plus 1, and I want to write it in the image of this norm. And to do so, uh, we are just going to apply the CQPHS property to the principal homogeneous space, uh, let's say uh, Z, which is given by the normic equation norm from M to L of x bar equals A q plus 1. And this is a principal homogeneous space under the normic torus norm equals 1. 
So we apply the CQPHS property in this situation and we write that uh, the tensor product A1 AQ has to be uh, in the NQ of Z over L. And once you have written that, it's just playing around with the properties of Milner K theory and the properties of the norm in Milner K theory that allows you to write this tensor product in the image of this norm map. So then you just have to use properties <coughs> of Milner K theory and norms. Okay, so now. Yes. So, so that was the proposition of Katwan Kuzumaki stated before that uh, followed from Bloch Kato's conjecture. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So now we want to go in the other direction. So let's say that my field has cohomological dimension at most q plus one, and I want to prove that k is CQPHS. And uh, to do so, we are going to proceed in three steps. So first step is essentially cohomological. So we prove the following theorem. Uh, let's say that k has cohomological dimension at most q plus 1. And uh, uh, you take alpha, a cohomology class, in a, your second cohomology class, with coefficients in a finite Galois modular. Important here, it's H2 and not uh, H1 typically. Okay, we take this situation and uh, we may then consider the group that I will denote NQ of alpha over K. So, uh, what is this thing? This will be, as before, a subgroup of the Milner K theory group of K, and it's the one that's spanned by those extensions that kill alpha. So. We look at the image of the norm coming from extensions L such that the restriction of alpha to L is trivial. We introduce this group and uh, the theorem says that this group is the whole Milner K theory group. Okay, so this is the, the result. Uh, how does the proof go through? I'm not going to explain it in detail, but uh, uh, just maybe idea of proof. So to prove this theorem, one has to proceed essentially in two steps. Uh, so the first step uh, is essentially a reduction step uh, that essentially is done by dévisage. You do some devisage, which are quite fine. And uh, if you do those devisage, you reduce to the case where uh, m is just z mod l z for some prime number l. And once you have done that, then you have to deal with this case z mod l z. And to deal with this case, you have to use bloch catus conjecture. And even somewhat more, you need some elements of its proof. So you need a bloch catus conjecture as well as uh, some properties of norm varieties. Uh, which are due essentially uh, to uh, Syslin and Zhukovitsky. So by norm varieties, I essentially uh, mean varieties that parameterize uh, typically extensions L that kill a cohomology class in coef with coefficients in Z mod LZ. All right. So this was the uh, first step. 
I'm getting lost in all my notes. OK, second step. Uh, consists in studying the case, uh, well, z is a principal homogeneous space under a uh, uh, quasi-split grip. So this so quasi-split grip G, so this means that G has a Borel subgroup. defined over the base field K. OK, so in this case, uh, uh, we use two things. So the first thing is to use a result of Scheinberg, which states that, uh, in some sense, Z comes from a principal homogeneous space under a maximal torus of G. So essentially, this allows us to reduce to some torus. And then one can use Arnold's lemma. So let's say that uh, uh, T is the maximal torus that we got. And then Arnold's lemma tells us, it's a representation theoretic result, it tells us that uh, we have some exact sequence, 1 of r0 t to some power, let's say t to the n, cross r1, 1, where here f is finite, r0 and r1 are quasi-trivial tori. And n is a positive integer. So this statement, I said it's representation theoretic just because it's proved, uh, I mean, you proved the, the dual statement on character mm -hmm. modules. And so now, if you apply cohomology to, to that exact sequence, what do you get? You get uh, uh, h1 of r0, h1 of t to the n cross h1 of r1, and then you get h2 of f, right? But here, by Hilbert's theorem 90, you know that this is 0. And this is 0. So this is telling you that h1 of t injects into the h2 of some finite module. <coughs> so now, you've started with a principal homogeneous space under a quasi-split grip. From it, you've gotten a principal homogeneous space under a maximal torus, and then this principal homogeneous space under a maximal torus, it leaves in H1 of KT. So you can consider, let's say, for example, I consider the first copy of H1 of KT here. And then you can consider its image in H2 of KF. And then you just have to apply the first step to the element you got in H2 of KF to conclude. So apply first step to H2 of Kf. OK, we finished the second step. And finally, the third step is the general case. OK, so uh, let's say that Z is a principal homogeneous space under some connected linear algebraic group G. And then, uh, by general results on algebraic groups, uh, we know that G is a twisted form of some quasi-split group. So here, H is quasi-split, 
and uh, A is a one q cycle uh, on H. And so now we have A, a one q cycle on H, so we can see the class of A in H1 of H. So this is a principal homogeneous space under a quasi-split grip, which is H. So if I apply uh, the, previous the previous step, the second step to A, that means that uh, we reduce to the case. Of course, one has to work with K-theory here, but we reduce to the case uh, well, the class of A is trivial. And then once the class of A is trivial, your group G is itself quasi-split. And so you can apply again the second step to Z. So then apply again the second step to Z which is under G, and G here is quasi-split if the class of A is trivial. And so this finishes the proof of uh, this implication. Okay, so I'm essentially over time. Uh, just, uh, uh, just, I'm going just to say that for the last implication, so that was uh, CQ PHS implies CQHS. So one has to work essentially uh, with a non abelian cohomology. So essentially, what, ha what one has to do is okay, one has a second abelian cohomology set, uh, non abelian cohomology set, sorry, that uh, essentially uh, will allow us to determine if a given homogeneous space uh, can be uh, mapped from some principal homogeneous space. So there will be a cohomology class that will be uh, what we say neutral if and only if above our homogeneous space there's a principal homogeneous space. If this class is trivial then we are done because uh, we just have to apply uh, the, the previous implication, I mean we just reduce to principal homogeneous space. But if this class is non-trivial, then you have to work a little bit uh, to see that uh, essentially you can make some davisage and in the end reduce to some uh, second abelian cohomology class. And then the case of second abelian cohomology classes, we know how to deal with it. That was just the first step there. And uh, I guess that's the end of my talk. So, um, so what I, the only thing I know as, a, as an implication, I mean, most implications, I don't know them, but uh, uh, the one we know is that uh, if we look at the CQ1 property I told you before, this one implies that the cohomological dimension of K is at most Q plus one. And we know that this is the same as, uh, for example, CQHS. So we have here an implication. Uh, otherwise, I don't know. Um, what I typically, I mean, if we look at the Kato and Kuzumaki's conjectures, what I expect, but I mean, uh, this is widely open, uh, is that, uh, so the, if you look at the C0i property, I think, so the question, should imply the Ci minus one property should imply the uh, CI minus two, two property and so on until the C uh, zero I property, which is, as we know, equivalent that the cohomological dimension is at most I. But I don't know these implications. What we definitely know is that the converse implications are wrong. 